Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm your host, Will Tanaka. I'm a full-time realtor and former Hawaii real estate litigation attorney. And, you know, I love today's topic because it affects a significant number of sellers in Hawaii. So we're going to talk about HARPTA and FERPTA. And you're asking, what is that? Well, this show is going to be for you if you own real property in Hawaii, it's your second home, or it's your investment property and you live off-island, you're military, you're a trustee who lives on the mainland, you're a foreigner, you have a mainland LLC who owns property in Hawaii. So it's going to affect a lot of people and it, it's going to be jam-packed. So what time is it? It's showtime, baby. And today we have a very special guest, Brad Konishi, CPA. Welcome, Brad. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Will. I, um, you know what? I, I haven't had a chance to do this show before, and so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Oh, I'm so excited. So just to give everyone a background about Brad, I mean, he's my go-to person when it comes to taxes about, you know, HARPTA and FERPTA and real estate transactions. So he's a licensed CPA since 2001. He's an instructor of residential real estate tax rules, 1031 exchanges, and foreign sellers. He's a financial uh, auditor. He was with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, controller for HBR, Honolulu Border Realtors. And he's the current owner of Brad K CPA LLC, which is an accounting firm specializing in assisting realtors and their clients, just like you viewers. And he's also the president of Harp to Help LLC. Ooh, that is a lot of experience, Brad. <laughs> it sure does. And it makes me feel old just reading <laughs> that off. But, but yeah, just, uh, you know, the, the, the company that, uh, we're focused on now that I'm focused on now is Harp to Help. Uh, you know, we, what we do is we help home sellers who are dealing with issues of Harpta and FERPTA. And, and like you said, this is something that occurs for, uh, quite a number of sellers, uh, you know, who are selling real property in Hawaii. Got it. Got it. Okay, well, let, let's get started because this is always a hot topic. And oftentimes, you know, it might be a surprise for the sellers if they're like, oh, we have to pay HARPTA. What, well, what is that? I've never heard of it. Yeah, let, let's, so, let's, yeah. Talk, let, let's talk a little bit about that. HARPTA is actually an acronym and it stands for the Hawaii Real Property Tax Act. Uh, it's a rule that went into effect, I believe it was probably in the late 80s or early 90s. And, and the reason why it was put into effect is that uh, Hawaii noticed that, the, you know, there were some uh, substantial gains that were happening in the Hawaii real estate market then, uh, you know, very similar to what we've been experiencing for the last several years. But what was happening at that time was uh, mainland and foreign investors were taking their proceeds and they were disappearing without paying Hawaii income taxes. So, um, you know, this is a way for Hawaii to protect themselves to make sure that, uh, you know, there's some sort of withholding on the sale to make sure that all taxes are going to be covered by the seller. So it's just something like a security deposit of sorts. I see. So, for example, like if I own the investment property, I live in Hawaii. When I sell it and there's capital gains, of course, I'm going to be, you know, paying taxes, right? Yes, yes. Well, usually, usually you're going to be, well, yeah, possibly, usually, yeah, yeah. You're usually you're going to be paying taxes, and if you if you if you do, you know, this is uh, this is a way for Hawaii to get some of that money uh, prior, you know, prior to tax time to make sure that they're covered, uh, you know, um, and and that you know the the non-resident Hawaii non-resident pays all of the taxes that they owe. Got it. Got it. Okay, so let's start with the basics. So HARPTA stands for, again, uh, the Hawaii Real Property Tax Act, and it's it's okay. an assessment that's uh, done on the the gross sales price. So, um, you know, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about examples. Let's just use a million dollar home sale example. In, in the case of a million dollar home sale, the HARPTA that would apply would be seventy two thousand five hundred, which is you know seven and a quarter percent of the million dollars. So, um, as you can see, it's a it's a fairly it's a fairly large dollar amount. You know, and it's a it, lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It's pretty significant. So, so people are always uh, looking for ways to try to get, uh, you know, get over it, get around it, or get through it, one way or the other. Okay, so just to make it clear, if a non-resident of Hawaii, they, you know, they live on the mainland or they're a foreigner, they're selling a Hawaii real property, and let's say you're selling for a million dollars, so seven point two five percent, that has to go to the state of Hawaii tax department. 
Yep. And, and I should clarify that it's yeah. actually um, it's actually not, uh, you know, where where the where it all falls in the responsibility actually falls on the buyer. So the buyer is the one actually responsible for collecting it, even though it's the seller who pays it. But what happens is uh, so with, when the buyer pays their money to escrow uh, on the buyer's instructions, uh, if HARPTA applies, uh, in this million dollar transaction, uh, escrow will set aside seventy two thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, you know, during the escrow process, the contract phase, and then the the seller will receive their proceeds less the seventy two thousand five hundred. So that seventy two thousand five hundred dollars is now considered to be an estimated tax payment that goes to the state of Hawaii if the seller wasn't able to get a waiver for the harpda. Ah, uh, I see. Okay, so this. 72,500, the 7.25%. It's not, you, you just lose it. You have to give it away to the state. Yeah, it's, it, it, you lose it, but temporarily, you know, it, 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 of course, it feels very painful, especially for people who have uh, not a whole lot of proceeds coming back to them, right? 72,500 right. can make a really big difference. And right. so it, it can, it can be painful, but it's considered to be a prepayment towards any taxes that the, that the home seller might owe for either capital gains or sometimes in the case of, uh, uh, general excise tax. You know, if the, if the, uh, homeowner had a rentals going on and they weren't paying general excise tax, you know, sometimes the general excise tax could be paid out of that hard them. Okay. Oh, well, okay. So it's good news that it's not actually tax then. Yeah, it's not a tax. It's uh, the way I look at it, it and the way I explain it to a lot of our clients is that it's uh it's kind of like the difference between paying rent or paying a security deposit, right? With this, with a with rent, there's the expectation that you're going to pay this amount to your landlord, and your landlord isn't going to give you anything back because you owe the rent. However, with a security deposit, there's the expectation that, okay, I'm paying this over, you know, to the landlord in one case or to the state in, if you're a home seller, uh, with the expectation that in the end, I'm probably going to get back maybe most of my money. Who knows? Maybe all of my, my money, but it will depend on my circumstances at the end of my lease and how much I actually owe. So uh -huh. uh, it's very much like, uh, like the difference between a security deposit and, and paying rent. Okay, that's that is a genius metaphor of you know paying this withholding versus uh equivalent to like a security deposit where you could likely get back most of it. Mm -hmm. So thank th thank you for that analogy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 I I know it's it's a uh, it's an area of uh, a lot of um I guess you could say distress. Yeah, you know, when the, when the the home seller sees it on their seller statement for the first time, especially if they weren't notified of it beforehand. But you you know what? Even though if they're notified of it beforehand, sometimes the dollar amount is so large that it can still be quite a shock. You know, it, it actually is going to be, you know, behind maybe your, the payoff to your mortgage company is probably going to be the largest dollar amount uh, on your estimated seller statement. You know, the statement that escrow gives you when you're in contract. Okay. So in terms of the definition of a resident of Hawaii, can you go into that a little bit? So how would you be exempt? So, you know, I live in Hawaii, then, you know, I don't think I would have to pay HARPTA, right? So that's pretty simple because I, this is my principal resident in the state of Hawaii. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, there are a number of ways to establish Hawaii residency and um, uh, the, the two ways are, are um, by your physical presence in the state or by something called domicile, which has a lot to do with your intention. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about the, you know, establishing residency in the state, because, you know, there are some, there are some people like you and I will, who are clearly residents, right? I mean, you know, even if we sold a home, we're still going to continue to live here. This is where our family is, this is where our job is, and this is where we live. Uh, so right. on one end of the spectrum are people like you and I. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum are people who are, you know, maybe own a rental home in Hawaii, but never intend to live here. You know, it's strictly a rental home. Hawaii is just a place to visit from time to time, maybe. Um, but, you know, there's this big gray area right in the middle. People who might be considered residents or might not. And, and you know, one of the situations we do run into is something you started talking about a little bit earlier, where somebody is you know, has lived here for a while, and then they're selling a home uh, within the anticipation of moving to the mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, 
One of the things about HARPTA is that the state's opinion is that your prior residency really doesn't matter. You could be a resident for 50 years. The only thing that matters for HARPTA purposes is going to be what your residency status is as of the date you close. And so if you're not a resident as of the date you close, uh, regardless of your prior residency status, HARPTA will apply. So that's something kind of, that's kind of important to understand. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I got to just kind of get into that. So okay. if I've been you know living here all my life, for example, right? long-term resident and you know I, I moved to california yes in december and we close in december okay so does that mean i'm i have to pay harpta even though i've been you you may you know and it really it really all depends on uh where you are at that point in time right okay. but here's the thing right i talked a little bit earlier about establishing your your residency via physical presence Okay. or establishing residency during domicile. So look, let's look at your situation through this lens. Uh, how are we going to establish residency for you? You know, a person who's left Hawaii and is, you know, in, maybe in the process of moving to California. Um, so if you're, if, if you, you know, the person who's moving to California is trying to establish your residency by domicile, um, in that case, you may have already given up your residency, right? Because domicile uh, really says, well, first of all, you can only have one domicile at a time for harm to purposes. So if you uh, if, if you've given up your I mean, if you've already established domicile in California, by definition, you've given up your Hawaii domicile. So, um, you know, if you've accepted a job in California, if you've, uh, you know, bought a new home or you're, you know, you're renting a new home, you, you know, you're living permanently, you know, you're going to be staying there for a while and you're in the process of selling your only home that you own in Hawaii, it, you know, from the, from the, from the standpoint of domicile, that really looks like you've already accepted a new domicile of California. So it's going to be difficult to qualify for residency under domicile. Um, for physical presence, you know, if you were physically present for the entire year, you might be able to, you know, make the the argument that yes, I am a resident because look, I've been here for a certain amount of time. However, one of the rules about establishing your residency by physical presence says that your physical presence cannot be temporary or transitory. And those, mm -hmm. those two words are pretty important because if you're in the process of moving out to California, uh, you know, you've established your, uh, you know, a new place to live uh, and you're only here in Hawaii temporarily, you know, maybe you're here just to sign closing papers or what have you, you know, uh, then in that case, maybe you aren't a resident. So it, there's really a lot of questions that need to be answered and everything needs to be looked at on a case by case basis. You know, mm. uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, is, you know, how about if I, I have a Hawaii driver's license or I'm registered to vote? Um, yeah. One thing to keep in mind is there's no one specific action that you can take that turns you from a non-resident into a resident and, and vice versa. Um, it really all depends on the totality of your circumstances. Oh, that's a fancy word. Totality <laughs> of circumstance. Well, yeah. let's get into military. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, so if, you know, they come from Virginia to Hawaii, they're here for two, three years. Um, are they exempt or are they considered resident for purposes you know, of HARPTA? That's a great question. You know, we get we do deal with a lot of military clients. That's why that's kind of a subspecialty of ours. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, many of the military service members that are stationed in Hawaii actually don't declare Hawaii as your state of legal residency. And let me tell you mm -hmm. what that means mm -hmm. is what that means is uh, their military income is not going to be subject to Hawaii income tax. So they, they pay no Hawaii income tax on their military income to the st state of Hawaii. Um, if they have a spouse, uh, their spouse might be able to declare uh, that other state as their state of legal residency. And it might be possible for the spouse not to have to pay any Hawaii state income tax as well. So um, because of that, um, the state says because they are allowed this exemption from Hawaii state income taxes for the purposes of their home sale, 
we can't consider them to be Hawaii residents. And so when they sell their home, uh, they may be subject to HARPTA. Uh, there are ways to get around it because there's a tax rule called the main home gain exclusion that we use that military service members can kind of lean on. It's a federal tax rule that Hawaii follows to the letter. And, uh, you know, because they follow this rule, they, uh, you know, they don't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, need to have HARPTA withheld if they can get a waiver by applying for one. Okay, let's get into that because we have, um, I believe, you know, a lot of military audience as well. So they come here, they're stationed for three years. They're not paying, you know, they're exempt from paying state income taxes to the state of Hawaii. Yes. So now they're going back to the mainland. Okay. Right? Or So, so what happens? So you're saying that they don't have to pay the 7.25%. So let, let's say they're selling a, Ever Beach House for a million dollars. Okay, okay, uh, okay. that's yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, there's. I, I guess you. I should. I should uh, clarify. Let's. But you. Let's use your example. Let's say okay. they're selling an Ever Beach home for a million dollars, um, and and they lived in the home. Let's say for the last two and a half years. So, okay. so they've been stationed in Hawaii for two and a half years. Um, uh, you know, shortly after they were stationed here, they bought a home and then they moved into it, and now they've have two and a half years of actually you know, being in the home, living in the home as their main home, but they're still not Hawaii residents, right? So because they're still not Hawaii residents, HARPTA will apply, but they can apply for a waiver uh, with the form that the Hawaii, the state of Hawaii puts out called an N-288B. And I won't okay. get too much into the form names, but it's a form that Hawaii puts out that you, you, the home seller can fill that out uh, if they are able to demonstrate to the state of Hawaii reviewers that they shouldn't be subject to capital gains tax on, on the gain on their sale, uh, then they should be able to get a what's called a withholding certificate. And that withholding certificate okay. allows them to sell without having to worry about heart debt at all. Okay, yeah, I believe there was a slide for that. So prior to before closing, you would have to apply for a what's called a withholding certificate N288B. Yes, yes, you got it. Yeah, ah, got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, as you can see, the slide there says uh, that uh, the military personnel must submit form N-288B to the department for to apply for a waiver from this withholding. But they can apply for a waiver for this withholding. And we often get it because this tax rule will allow a single individual to waive the first 250000 of gain on the sale of their house. Or if they're a married couple filing jointly, they can waive up to 500000 of gain on the sale of their house. So, you know, if a, if a military service member is stationed here for a couple of years, usually their gains will be less than those amounts. So they usually should be able to get a waiver of, uh, of heart, to, uh, you know, completely. Okay. So let's say in that example, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it, you know, either a foreign investor or a mainland owner, and let's just use Eva Beach. Let's go back to the West side. Okay. They purchased the property for nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. They're selling it for a million dollars. Okay. How it, would Harpta apply? Especially they have the cost for the commissions, you know, escrow and title. How, how does that all work? So no, no, that's yeah. that's good. Okay, so they purchased for nine fifty. They're selling right. for a million. But you talked right, right. about uh, you you talked about some of the expenses that go into the transaction, and there are there are a lot of expenses that go into a real estate transaction. I mean, if you've ever sold a home before you're going to see name after name after name people getting pieces of your money <laughs> and so it's something to be aware of but a lot of these uh, a lot of these expenses can be considered to be selling expenses that you can use to offset some of your gains. So, mm. uh, in the case of somebody who's selling for a million but uh, purchased for nine fifty, the differential is only fifty thousand dollars. But chances are pretty good that once you add up things like uh, the commissions for both the buyers and the sellers agent, uh, as well as things like uh, escrow fees, title insurance, uh, even transfer taxes, once all of those expenses are added to it, you might actually be able to generate a lot. Loss. And if you can generate a loss, a tax loss, uh, you, you can file for a HARPTA waiver and it should be easily, uh, mm -hmm. it shouldn't even be a, a question. You know, HARPTA waiver should be allowable in, in your instance. Okay, I see. So th that's something that you and your company would help with. Yes, applying for those exemptions. Exactly, exactly. Ah, so, okay. so the thing about these forms is, uh, though, the forms are, the forms are kind of tricky. And, and, and if, if you, you know, 
we approach the forms from you know our experience doing you know hundreds and hundreds of these forms before and knowing what the state will accept and what the state you know doesn't want to accept and so you know that knowledge really helps us to uh you know get the forms done in a format that the state finds acceptable mm. wow okay so let's say that you didn't apply for for a um withholding or an exemption like okay. permission from the the state tax office okay and you close and the 72 uh, 72,500 is sent to the state tax department so what happens next okay yeah there there are there are a couple of ways you can deal with it if you weren't able to get a waiver or uh any kind of reduction in in harta prior to closing the way you deal with it is one you can apply for an early refund there is a form called an n288c uh and 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 this really really matters for people who are closing in say the earlier part of the year because if you're closing in the earlier part of the year you don't want to wait until the following year and have to you know do a tax return then so you can file for an early tentative refund after closing uh this is something that we do um and, and surprisingly what we found is that most refunds for clients who take this uh take this route uh will take between 60 to 75 days from closing until they actually receive a check in the mail so um applying for the early refund is a possibility but if it's uh, if the person doesn't want to apply for an early refund uh they can wait until the following year and they can fill out a Hawaii income tax return. When they fill out a Hawaii income tax return, they should be able to get a refund back that way as well. So there are a couple of ways to deal with it. Um, you know, one is that early refund or the second would be a uh, tax return after after closing. Wait a minute, okay. An early refund. I mean, yeah. th that's only for the state, right? You can't do that with the IRS. Uh, you, you yeah, technically you can do it with the IRS, oh. but you know what? It's super, super hard because okay. the IRS has been going. The IRS <laughs> for the last three years has been well, two and a half years. Um, uh, the IRS has been going through what's called a logjam. Uh, it's a they call it a logjam of ep epic proportions. If if you, if you've been watching the IRS for the last decade, uh, you may have been noticed. You may have seen that the IRS's budget has been trimmed. Uh, you know, more and more and more over over the last decade. But it all came to a head when COVID hit and then when this labor shortage hit because uh, it, it's, it you know, it was a lot of people were working remotely. And then when the IRS figured out they needed a lot more people, they tried to hire, but they were <laughs> it's hard to find people because of the labor shortage. So oh, wow. uh, technically it, it's possible and we, we've been able to do it in the past. We've been able to get early refunds in the past. From a practical standpoint, working with the IRS on this right now, super, super difficult. <laughs> so wow. yeah, yeah. But but you know what? The state the state hasn't suffered the same sorts of problems that the IRS has. And the state has been really good about getting back refunds on time. That's great news. Yeah. So so basically if you're a seller. You're not potentially a non-resident of Hawaii. Make sure they reach out to you, Brad. You know, Harp to Help LLC to get some advice, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, they, it's. I mean, for those people who know me, like you will, you, you know, and, you know, I, I, I just like talking about taxes. <laughs> so if you have questions, you know, about your particular situation, and and you, you know, you're particularly if you're a non-resident or uh, or a foreign person, and you're thinking about selling, and you're thinking about the ramifications of of what will happen during the sale, give me a call because you know the good thing about our business is we see uh, we see so much so much turnover. Meaning that um, it used to be before when I did you know when we just focused on tax returns you know we do i do maybe two or three consulting jobs every every month but nowadays i'm doing th three to four sometimes five consulting jobs in a, in a day so you, you know we the, the amount of volume that we get allows us to see a lot of different situations and and expand our experience so i think that's primarily our advantage wow okay that is i mean this is jam packed this is a wealth of knowledge and so we talked about harpta right yeah. for for Hawaii let's talk about FERPTA okay okay FERPTA is the federal equivalent of HARPTA and I there's a slide up there right now that's talking about the different rates for FERPTA FERPTA can be as low as zero percent sometimes it's ten percent 
for all practical purposes, I, I tell people who are, you know, somebody who is a foreign person who is selling, you might as well just assume it's going to be 15% because it's almost always 15%. Um, but it's a, you know, just like Harpda, it is not a tax in and of itself. It's a withholding. It's an amount that the federal government takes and holds because they have no idea what your tax liability is going to be. So they take and they hold this amount. And once you can prove to them, if you can prove to them that your tax liability is less than what they're holding, at that point, they'd be obligated to give you a refund. Okay, I'm going to just stop you there. You said 15%, right? Like one yes. five, 15% one five. for yes. HARPDA. Yes. And then 7.25% for HARPDA. Yes. Okay, so that's a combined, what is that, Matt? 22.5%? Yeah, somewhere around there. So it's like, a, you know, a, a, over a fifth, almost almost a quarter of your, your gross sales price for a foreign person uh, may be withheld for Harpta and Firpta. So uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of money to be wow. without, especially if you have a transaction that happens, say, in the early part of the year, right? For, for a lot of our foreign sellers, they want at least part of their money back. Um, so yeah, it, it's one of those things that it's uh, it's it's important for those sellers to know that there is an alternative. There, you know, the IRS and the state of Hawaii are not going to take this amount and and keep it forever. But you have a finite amount of time to get it back. You have three years uh, to get this money back. Okay, so when it comes to FERPTA, can you talk about so who's subject to FERPTA and? You know, for example, I'm a U.S. citizen. Okay. So I would have to pay the 15%, right? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so who would have to pay the 15% potentially? Uh, uh, U.S. citizens, regardless of where they reside, are are not subject to FERPTA. So FERPTA wouldn't apply to anyone who is a U.S. citizen, regardless of where in the world that they live. Um, it applies to what are called foreign persons. And foreign persons are people who, um, uh, you know, uh, another per another group of people that don't apply to foreign persons are people who are green card holders. If you are a green card holder, FERPTA won't apply. But those people who are, you know, uh, residents of, of another country and don't live in the United States, don't have a green card, uh, or entities that aren't registered to do business in the United States are uh, maybe considered to be, you know, foreign owners as well. Those foreign owners are going to be uh, subject to FERPTA. Wow. So for a million dollar property, if they were subject to FERPTA and HARPTA, the amount they would have to pay is how much is that? Over, over, over 220,000. Yeah. So, wow. so 15, 15% for FERPTA and it's going to be seven and a quarter percent for HARPTA. So it's, yeah, 200, uh, 220 something thousand. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's money. That, that is a lot of money for a million dollar property. And, and, you know, in terms of trying to get exempt, of course, you know, make sure you consult with a tax professional like Brad's company. Yep. So we talked about FERTA, we talked about HARPTA. Any last uh, words for the audience? Uh, you, you know, I, I think I started off with my final message. I'm going to say it again. You're going to see this on, on your estimated seller statement if you're selling, if you're a you know, non-resident of Hawaii or a foreign person, don't freak out. This is just a withholding and you are entitled to get this money back. But also on the other side of the coin, don't walk away. This money is yours. This, this money that's being paid for HARPTA or FERPTA, if it's withheld, this money is being sent to the IRS or to the state, and it's your obligation to go and get this money back. You have three years to get it back. After that three years is over, you have no way to get it back. So just make sure, make sure you don't give up. You always try to get that money back one way or the other. Okay. Wow. This is, I mean, I learned so much, Rad. I knew no, a little bit at Harpta and Furpta, but I'm always learning something new from you. And how, how do people find you? Oh, you know what? It's easy to find us, harpta.com, www.harpta.com. Or you can send an email to info at harpta.com. Or you can call us at uh, 808-737-4412. Uh, give us a call on weekdays, uh, you know, sometime between 9 and 4 or so, and I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you. Okay, great. Well, Thank you so very much, Brad. Uh, you were awesome. And I'm sure that everyone learned a lot about Harpta and Furpta. And you make well, it fun. You're yeah, so passionate for, about it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for talking to me, Will. I always enjoy talking about this subject with uh, with you or anyone. Okay. Thank you so much, Brad. Okay. We'll take see care. You again. Bye.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.